I'll open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the right we have to vote. Thank you for guiding us through the process. Ask that you be with all of us as we go through our week. Be with us that need your tender, loving help, physically, emotionally, whatever that may be. We can always count on your love and care for us. Ask that you be with us as we go into the fall season, Thanksgiving, and looking forward to the Advent and the Christmas and the joy of your living <clears throat> son. Be with us as we go through the day. Bless our week. Amen. Without further ado, I don't think I need a long introduction. David, would you step up? So we have in-house speaker again. So okay. that's great. Look forward to it, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Back in the spring, um, there, there was just something that hit me. And it, it was, you need to talk about hell and you need to talk about heaven. Why? What, what is there to say? Well, he, he opened my eyes to that over the last couple of weeks. So I have learned a lot. And it is really uh, a blessing to be able to give this talk to you. But before I begin, I would like to thank Pastor Karen Johnson. Please stand. She's from, she is the lead pastor at the Second Presbyterian Church in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Please welcome her. She has uh, come, um, she probably hasn't been to one of my lectures, and Pastor, um, I'm an anesthesiologist, so I put everybody to sleep in a matter of minutes. <laughs> anyway, what I have learned is that heaven is not only a place in our distant future hope, that we're hopeful about, it has relevance to our current day lives, immediate re relevance. And we'll get into that. Um, first, um, I said I'm gonna base this on biblical as well as NDEs. And that was a little bit of a fib because um, it's mostly NDEs today. I am gonna be focusing on four different NDEs that will really give you different perspectives of heaven depending on the person and depending upon their spiritual development. We're going to start off with an atheist. So he's got a pretty distant view of heaven. <laughs> he doesn't get the close up pearly gates. But we'll work towards the pearly gates. We have one guy who's going to tell us about the pearly gates. And when we do that, I will give you the immediate uh, biblical references where the pearly gates are discussed. And I will be circulating the recording of this talk to you all, hopefully within a day or two, and I will attach my slides. And please, They'll be in the form of PowerPoint and PDF, so you should be able to open them up and actually find all the biblical references that we talk about today. So the most relevant uh, piece in the Bible that discusses heaven and hell is the one where uh, the poor Lazarus, Lazarus has laid outside the gates of the very rich man who never is given a name. And most likely it's because of where he ended up. But I'm not gonna read it. Um, in, in fact, I have not found a near-death experience that correlates with this one, where the rich man can see in the heaven and beg for Lazarus to come cool his tongue um, but I put it here and I, I put it written out because it does confirm that um, he just didn't believe. 
He ate sumptuously every day, and the beggar laying at his gate got only the crumbs, if that. So it's important as we learn about this, that we learn to share and love one another. And that's kind of the theme that's going to be throughout this. But here's our first one. And it's going to show you, uh, it's a full professor, Howard Pittman, that you've probably seen before. He's proud, arrogant, egotistical, and he t lets everybody know that. <laughs> and he's an atheist. The only reason, and I don't have, I don't have Howard Storm's book. I, I think I loaned it to somebody. Um, the only reason that he isn't just immediately thrown in hell as an atheist is that he had a nun in one of his art classes. And he said, meet me in the hall. Took her out of the class. He said, if you mention church or God once, I will throw you out of my class. And she said, fine. And she prayed for him every day for 13 years. Wow. And God heard those prayers. Wow. And that's why he was saved. But we're, I encourage you, there's links in the slides to all these presentations that you can watch the whole thing. We're just going to view the part where he has been torn apart by his escorts to hell and eviscerated and the worst imaginable treatment you can imagine is what he experienced. So let me uh, see if I can do this. Let's jump to that. For more than 20 years, when women and girls were attacked, assaulted, raped, I fought for them because they are to do the surgery. So that's why I didn't get any meds. You know, people tell me, well, the reason why you had your near-death experience was because of all the narcotics you've been given. And like, I begged for anything and I would... Feel that one. Um, you know, click it. Don't you understand? Yeah, you do. When the nurse came in and said that they were unable to locate a doctor, that's when I told my wife... Now we're going to play this one. Okay. Me or didn't like me or, you know, I mean, I had, I had nothing except this faint hope that it might be true. This impossibly bright light, like if it was actually light light, it would have, it would have. So what did he just do? He just screamed four words, four little words that saved his life. Jesus Please save me. And he said, I didn't have the faintest hope whether it would work or not. And immediately, this impossibly bright light appears. Now we're going to listen to a little bit until he sees heaven. Ugh. It burned me. I was like, you know, so overwhelmed by the brightness of the light and its beauty. And then like, I looked down at myself and I saw gore and I was like, ew, I had been eviscerated. Okay. Um, not pretty. And out of this light came hands and arms and he touched me. And when he touched me, three things happened. One is all the gore just started to disappear and I became whole. The other thing that happened was I was filled with ecstasy instead of being um, simply just nothing but pain from head to foot. Now all of a sudden that the pain goes away and I'm filled with ecstasy. And lastly, and most importantly, um, I experienced a love that I had never known that existed. And unfortunately, I haven't found any language yet that can begin to describe it. He picked me up, he held me real tight Thing. when he held me I knew that there was besides all this healing and love and all that that he really really liked me a lot matter of fact I'm his favorite person in the whole universe I have to add unfortunately you are too 
<laughs> and, and he likes me. I mean, he doesn't dislike me. He's not, he's not, you know, he's not mad at me. You know, he's happy. So I'm holding on to Jesus. So I'm crying, happy cry. And he's um, rubbing my back. He gave me a nice, very soft, tender back rub. And we take off. Just like flying in a helicopter, except it was just Jesus and me without the helicopter. All I'm aware of, because like I've got my face buried in his chest and neck, was we're going. We're really going. And actually, I'm a, I'm a little bit scared, because I'm actually thinking, so I hope he doesn't let go of me. <laughs> so we're moving, and um, I'm trying to get my act together, because I'm feeling, I, I've put a lot of slobber on him from my nose and mouth, a lot, a lot of slobber. And I'm feeling bad about that because I don't have a hanky to clean them up. <laughs> and, um, uh, okay, so I'm trying to get together. So I get enough together and I, and I look and I see like we're moving towards a world of light and all around the world of light, like a bazillion little lights going in and coming out and that's all this activity. And I had this gigantic, uh-oh, the God that I said wasn't, we're going to his house. We're going into his territory. I mean, I know that. I just know that somewhere in that big galaxy of light, if you will, there's God in that. And we're headed towards it. And I am the biggest idiot in the whole world. And they probably hate me, you know, because of what I've said and done. I think to myself, he's made a terrible mistake. I don't belong here. And with that, we come to a, a stop and we are outside of the world of light, which we could call heaven because that's what it was. I call it home. He spoke to me for the first time telepathically and he said, we don't make mistakes. You belong here. So there's some lessons there. <clears throat> You should feel nervous if you don't have a nun praying every day for 13 years. <laughs> I just want, I don't have one. So I'm, I, I'm not feeling comfy yet. But we'll look at other NDEs. And uh, what's this? <laughs> so this is kind of a summary of what Howard Storm went through he doesn't even get close to heaven but he sees a bazillion lights going in and out of it. those are angels matter of fact Mark Karakovic and I are talking on angels in March. Be sure to make that one because this will take your NDE knowledge to a new level. But we're not talking about that today. But what is heaven? It's no pain, just ex ecstasy and love that no language can describe. Uh, so Jesus said, we don't make mistakes here. The second one I'm going to talk about is an Irish Indian, she calls herself, worthless woman with a bad temper. She was told she was a heathen and going to hell because she was Indian and Irish. Her seven children had been told the same thing when she tried to put them in church. Imagine that. They had to spend time on their knees every day to beg for forgiveness. So here's her talk, and we'll probably have trouble again. Matter of fact, do you want to get this talk? <laughs> this Donald Trump talks about cutting Social Security and Medicare. It's like spitting in the face of America's seniors. Watch this before drinking plant-based milks. Oat milk latte. Protein and oats at almost exactly. Tell me what your life was like before. Abuse uh, and so at the age of 31, I had married young and had uh, seven children. 
that was it was very frightening to me to go through that experience um, of of life just growing up but I wanted a family that I could be with forever and um, so I married and had my own my children raised them the way that I wanted to raise them uh, I actually took them and put them into churches uh, only to become disillusioned and uh, take them out because they were told that they were they were sinners and had to get on their knees and they're like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, you know, just babies. And when they came back and told me what they that they had to spend time on their knees begging God for forgiveness, that just did it for me and religion. Um, at the age of 31, I went into the hospital to have a hysterectomy. And it was during that time, first time I'd ever had any surgery or anything at all. I'm a fairly healthy woman, have always been healthy. Uh, went into the hospital, I hemorrhaged during surgery and right shortly after. And, um, and they had staff problems and there were a few nurses that were around. They told me that uh, I was fine after the surgery, except for a slight hemorrhage that they had repaired and um, bedded me down for the night. I awoke um, and I felt myself dying, actually. You know, you just feel this sick feeling and, and uh, I knew something was wrong, but I was too weak to call for the nurse. And the next thing I knew, I was out of my body. I went up to the up to the ceiling and turned to look down and I could see myself uh, laying there. I came down for a closer look and I wasn't frightened. I was amazed at what I saw. Um, and shortly thereafter, three men and brown robes and golden belts appeared by the side of the bed. I knew them, but I, I, it was taking me a while to, to really recognize them. But I knew I was comfortable with them. And um, they said that I had died prematurely, but that everything would be okay. I was worried about my family. I wanted to go home and see them. And so I went out, my spirit went out through the window and I arrived at my home. My husband was sitting in a chair, reading a newspaper. The kids were running all over the place. He had promised to put them to bed early and he didn't. But I knew that they would be fine. And uh, I started to, I could see into each one of their lives and I knew that they would grow up and that they would be fine. It was okay to leave them. Um, I went back to the hospital bed and started traveling down uh, in, into a tunnel-like effect, just spiraling down it. I mean, it, it was moving. I came to a dark place, very dark, very black. I love to camp and have gone camping a lot. And when you're in the middle of the forest, especially in the state of Washington, where the trees are Oh my goodness, you know, they're so tall. When you're in the middle of them, you don't see the sky at night. It's pitch black. Well, it was pitch black in this space, but I felt no fear. And I have claustrophobia. So it was challenging for me, even in that moment to think, I have no fears. I have no, I'm not frightened of this black. In fact, I felt like I was being bathed in love. It was warm and beautiful. It was, you know, I, I have often said, if I didn't know what, what was beyond this, this blackness, I would have wanted to stay there forever. I could live eternity in that space, but it didn't last for long. And there I saw a pinpoint of light um, that became brighter and brighter. It was almost like a searchlight. Uh, it moved around a bit, not a lot, but just a little bit where I was watching it and then it focused on me. And as it focused on me, it broadened. But more than that, it drew me out of that blackness. But when I came to the end of that light and the light was brighter than ever, it just widened and it turned, there was a, a beam in the, in, in the light. And I could see the shape and the outline, but the light was so bright. 
I knew that this was Jesus and I knew that I loved him and that I had always known him, perhaps for eternities as well. And then what surprised me as I thought back about on it, when I'm going through the process, it, there was no thinking. It was just responding in a very natural, normal way to this beautiful man that I knew that I had known forever. So it would be like dying and, and meeting your mother or your father, and you run to them to embrace them. And that's what I did with him. And I ran to him. And as I ran to him, he opened his arms to receive me in them. And we embraced. And I said, why did you send me to earth? Why did you send me down there? I never, ever, ever want to go there again. And he said, I said, much less send me down to become an Indian and an Irish person who was criticized and, and condemned for everything you think of. And I just ran and raved. I was just irritated. He chuckled. He leaned back and he just, he was amused. I, and I thought at the time, how could he be amused at something when I feel so in, irritated, even angry about? And he said, but you chose it. I said, I did. He says, yes, you did. He said, every spirit here is at a different level of growth, everyone. And each one is on earth to be tested, to test with the, their growth that they have acquired thus far. And he said, and... We're each on earth to be tested. I don't know how to get back. <laughs> so, so this is pretty phenomenal, and I wish that we had time to go into it. This is her book. I love the title, Embrace by the Light. And if you read it, you will know it expands quite a bit on this theory, not this theory, this fact that we choose. We choose a lot of what our life is like because we know where we need to grow spiritually. Up in heaven, you know, there's many different levels, as Jesus said, and each one of us chooses. And some of them are trying to put two people together that don't like each other because they want them to be their parents. And then they can come to earth. So it's very specific about what you're choosing and how you're choosing it. And our ultimate goal is to grow spiritually here on earth. Let me give you one example. And usually what I wanted to say, you remember Lynn George from last week. Usually the stronger spirits choose a disability, a significant disability. They may not live for very long. They may actually be an infant that has a disease and their parent, they go through that so that their parents can grow spiritually. But let me read you just a little bit. <clears throat> this time my vision was focused on a street corner. She's up in heaven. Her angels are trying to teach her about spiritual growth. There I saw a man lying in a drunken stupor on the sidewalk near a building. One of the guides said, what do you see? Why, a drunken bum lying in his wallow? I said, not understanding why I had to see this. My guides became excited. They said, now we will show you who he really is. This is the spiritual being. His spirit was revealed to me and I saw a magnific magnificent man full of love, love emanating from his being and understood that he was greatly admired in heaven. This great being came to earth as a teacher to help a friend that he spiritually bonded with up in heaven. His friend was a prominent attorney who had an office a few blocks away from this corner. And all the, although the drunk had no recollection of this agreement with his friend, his purpose was to be a reminder to him 
of others' needs. Have you ever been in a room, somebody walks in and where, where, where have we met before? You, you, you look so familiar. And I was telling Joe, I said, Joe, we were probably buds up in heaven. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a number of you have walked in and I'm, I'm going, I should know their name. I haven't seen them. But a number of us are spiritually together and we'll be together up in heaven. So it's something to think about that each one of us chooses our spiritual challenges. So we shouldn't feel bad that you know, we have this disability or that disability. And I think Lynn probably is one of the stronger spirits because she chose to come down here with a disability that she would have to grow with. Okay. So let me try to go on here. Right here, right here all. So this is just summarizes what she said. Her goal as a spirit on earth was to love God, love one another, experience freedom from fear. And she said, how do we praise God? We praise God by our very essence when we love and are kind to one another. And that's where I just read you from page 98. Our next, next experience is one of uh, my favorites, and I'm going to play quite a bit of it. American Christian. I went to Sunday school when I was a kid. Just I was confirmed in the church American when I was in middle Christian. school. And then <laughs> I went to college and medical school and training. And I bought into the idea that you had to choose between science and spirituality. Now, I was a good person. I mean, I certainly bought into the concept of being a good person and honest and ethical and a woman of integrity and all those sorts of things. But the fact is I was really busy. I became a wife, a full-time surgeon, I was the director of spine surgery at a big university. And pretty soon I had four little kids to take care of. <laughs> I mean, Jesus to me was one more thing on my to-do list that I knew I was never going to get to. But that all changed one day in 1999 when I died. And yes, I literally mean died. I spent 30 minutes under eight to 10 feet of water without oxygen at the base of this waterfall. And <clears throat> while I was underwater and dying, <laughs> I asked that God's will be done. And the minute I asked that, I was immediately overcome with a very, very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured by Christ. And he took me through a life review was, that was like nothing She's in under 10 feet of water, deafening 10 feet of water. She can't even say anything. She thinks, God, your will be done. And immediately she's being held by Jesus. If that doesn't speak volumes to you, that our Lord and Father in heaven Here's every thought we have. He's immediately available. Heaven is available to us 24-7. This happened in 1999. Six billion people were on the planet in 1999. And he hears one lost person who says, your will be done. He loves all of us. Thing I could have imagined. I was reinserted into every one of the most painful memories of my life. But this time was different. 
I had a complete understanding of the life story of the other people involved, and I felt nothing but compassion, even for the people who had hurt me deeply. And I discovered that where God's love is present, there is no room for destructive emotion. I discovered grace. And then I was also shown the beauty that came out of each and every one of those painful experiences when seen from a distant perspective. Eventually my body came over the front deck of my boat and when that happened my spirit rose up and out of the river and I was immediately greeted by a group of people or spirits beings who were so overjoyed to welcome me home. I know that they had loved me and known me as long as I have existed. And even as I was with them and rejoicing, I could look back at the river and I could see my friends pull my bloated purple body to shore and watch them start CPR. And I had a wonderful life. But even as I watched that, I knew that I was home and I had no intention of returning. And these people or spirits started taking me down this beautiful pathway that exploded with colors and flowers and the aromas of flowers, which is what speaks beauty to my soul. And I absolutely believe that God presents to each one of us the experience at the time of our death that does speak beauty to us, that lets us know that we are known and loved. And we finally got to the end of this pathway and I was there for what felt like many, many hours. And during my time there, I had a complete understanding, a complete understanding of the divine order of the universe, how it could possibly be true that there is a God that is real and present today knows each and every one of the billions of us on this planet individually, <laughs> loves each and every one of us as though we're the only ones, and has a plan for each and every one of us and for the world that's one of hope. And eventually I was told that it wasn't my time, that I had more work to do on earth and that I would have to go back to my body. So I did what, <laughs> any reasonable person would do and I said I'm good I can stay <laughs> but here I am I got kicked out the uh, <laughs> but they took that opportunity to then give me this laundry list of work yet to be done everything on the list would be challenging but certainly one of the most challenging uh, things on that list had to do with the coming and unexpected death of my oldest son he was hit and killed by a car 10 years later. But at that time, he was only nine. And when I asked the obvious question of why, why my, why my boy? I was immediately returned to my life review where I had been shown the truth in God's promise that beauty comes of all things, eventually. <laughs> and I was reminded that it is always a matter of trust, trusting God's promises to us. <clears throat> And with that then, I was reunited with my body. And I continued to have supernatural experiences over the next couple of weeks. But then finally the window, my personal window into heaven, closed. And I was left with the consequences of my injury and I underwent many, many surgeries and many more months of rehab. And I spent those many months of rehab trying to figure out what had happened to me? I researched extensively every possible explanation or excuse that anyone had ever mentioned. I researched, of course, dreams and hallucinations and DMT or other neurotransmitter trips. Uh, you know, could it have been just the physiologic process of a dying brain? And at the end of many, many months of research, I had to conclude that mine had been a true and spiritual experience. And I discovered also <laughs> that science and spirituality actually coexist very easily. 
because they answer different questions. And I also discovered that I wasn't alone in this experience. Almost 20 million people in this country alone have had this sort of profoundly transformative experience. And I've spent many years, of course, thinking about my experiences, and I, I recognize that my most important transformation was moving from hope or a faith in God's promises to an absolute trust. And I do not mean to discount the faith of the Bible, but faith in our culture is so often based on reading or other people's experiences, and it can certainly be strong, but it can just as easily be shaken or lost when challenged. But trust is solid. Trust is an active choice based on the presence of God and the experience of God's trustworthiness in one's own life. And I will tell you that trust for me is sort of uh, faith in action. And I will tell you what it looks like in my life. First of all, because of trust, I'm free. <laughs> I am free from all bondage to my past. I don't feel guilt. I don't feel remorse, regret for anything I've done or not done. Because I trust that God knows me completely and knows my story, knows my failings. And in that knowledge, through grace, feels nothing but compassion for me. And I also know that I would feel nothing but compassion for people in my past, because if I knew their true story, I too would feel nothing but compassion for them. And so I am free from bitterness, hate, anger, even minor irritation that people have caused me. And I don't have worry or anxiety about my future because I trust that God has a plan for my life that is one of hope. <laughs> to heaven and beyond, you can have this book, you can borrow it, just like the person that took Howard Storm's book, but return it to me. <laughs> it's an extraordinary thing. Somebody has to go back knowing their son's going to die and almost know the time frame. She knew the time frame that his death would occur, and it occurred within an hour of that. <clears throat> but she moved from hope in God to an absolute trust in God. And so let me just give you one thing that I think I've said before to this group. One of the things that's important is um, the, this uh, story about trust in God. Uh, a businessman was going into uh, the heart of the city for a business meeting and he was late and he said, please, 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 Find me a parking spot. There is nothing available. And he drives around the block and all of a sudden there's a parking spot right in front of the door. And he says, never mind, God, I just found one. <laughs> <coughs> That's me. <coughs> That's me. So a trust in God is something that takes your anxi anxiety level down and you accept that he is already involved in your life he's already looking out for you i went to the vote this morning and there were cars on the curb way before i was getting any of the parking slots and all the parking slots were filled and there was a long line of over 100 people and all of a sudden as I started to pass this one truck, there was an open spot. I said, thank you, Lord. And I pulled in. It only took 30 minutes for over 100 people to vote. So it, even if there's a long line, it's worth waiting. But think about how you can come to trust the Lord. Think about it in everyday things. 
I was out running with my daughter. I think I told you this story and uh, hit my toe on a rock that didn't move. And as I went down the face plant, I said, how can this be good news, Lord? <laughs> but it was. It showed people I was fallible. It showed that I was a little bit uncoordinated, probably. But anyway, let's move on to a couple more. Let's see if you want to get out of this. Yeah. See if I if I'm teachable. Went back to your presentation. Yep. Yeah. So I've summarized um, Mary Neal's testimony. You can read through that. You can see it. Trust for me is faith in action. There I am. I am therefore free to be spiritually present in every moment of every day. It's difficult, but it's possible. So let's go to a little bit higher level. This isn't an everyday Christian. Oh, this is all the things about trust. There's over a hundred passages on trust. Most of them are in the Old Testament, believe it or not. There's five in the New Testament. But let's go to Reverend Don Piper. Let's see how different his um, experience of heaven is. He's a Baptist minister. He's just been coming from a Baptist convention, and he's on his way to his church for Sunday school, for, I think, for preaching. Higher taxes, men and girls sports. After 27 years of Bob Casey, we need a change. Check this out. I'm going to show you how I afforded this car. Okay, you ready? All right. Oh. I have a pleasure today of having uh, done a uh, pipe. So uh, the moment the truck struck me, I was standing at the gates of heaven. No long tunnel, no bright light at the end. Uh, a story as well as a little bit later, we're going to hear about the film that every Christian should bring their family members and unbelieving friends and skeptics to go and see and have this conversation starter about Christian faith. And so, Don, good morning, or some people will be watching this later. So, good, good morning to you, and a pleasure to have you with me today on YouTube channel. What an honor it is to be here. Thank you for having me. I've looked forward to this. Uh, Don, on January of 1989, you were yeah. in a car accident. You found yourself actually in heaven. And if you can kind of take us to that day um, of the accident, accident of what happened and how did you go to heaven? I was on my way to church, which I, I guess is a good uh, step towards heaven. But um, I was a pastor. I am a pastor. Okay. Uh, on my way to church from a pastor's conference oh, about wow. 120, 130 miles from my church in East, Southeast Texas. And so it was a cold, rainy day, and I was ready to get home. Uh, I enjoyed the conference, but I, I, I didn't get to bring my wife. She is a teacher, has been a teacher. She's retired now. And she couldn't come with me because she had a bunch of new students. And uh, so I was by myself. We had hoped it would be a getaway for the two of us. We had three small kids and we were looking forward to get away. Thank goodness she was not with me that day. Because after I left the conference, I was crossing a bridge, very narrow bridge in a rural area. And then before I exited the opposite end of the bridge, a tractor trailer truck an 18-wheeler came down a steep embankment onto the bridge and said he was uh, swerving to miss a car in his lane that was very slow and came into my lane and hit me head on. And the, uh, the driver's side wheels uh, just ran over my car because there were, I, there were rails on the bridge. I, I didn't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. He ran over me, killed me instantly, went off the back of my car and hit two more vehicles before he finally brought the rig to a halt. So I uh, I died there on the bridge. Um, you know, we're gonna take our last breath here one day and we're gonna take it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, was, I was prepared for death. I think heaven is a prepared place for prepared people, 
I just wasn't planning to die that day. Mm. And who is? So uh, the moment the truck struck me, I was standing at the gates of heaven, no long tunnel, no bright light at the end. Uh, I was killed at about 110 miles an hour of combined impact. Mm -hmm. So it was an instant uh, death. So you don't, you don't remember any, there. do you remember any pain? Was it like very painful? It wasn't a slow no, death. No, no, I wouldn't feel any pain for probably three or four hours. Um, uh, at least a couple of hours, three or four hours from the accident time, but maybe two hours, two and a half hours after I returned, I would start to feel pain because mm -hmm. I was even in shock here on the planet. But I wasn't on the planet. I was standing at one of the 12 gates of heaven. Revelation tells us there are 12 of them. I was at one, and it looked like the inside of an oyster. It is, without a doubt, a, a pearl pearl gate. You know, we, we heard about the pearly gates all of our lives. That's not mythological. That is factual. And uh, it was a magnificent gate. I thought it was a living gate because it, it seemed to be uh, glowing, glistening. But I think it was the light reflecting off the gate mm -hmm. because heaven is so brilliant, we'd be blinded by it with earthly eyes, but we won't have any earthly eyes there. It's We have heavenly eyes. Mm -hmm. And I was surrounded by people I'd known and loved in life who had preceded me in death. I knew all of them. Um, I, I now know that they were sent to greet me uh, so I'd know where I was. Uh, the first person I saw was my grandfather, very mm -hmm. close to him. I've been with him when he died, actually, rode with him in the ambulance after he had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so I was the one that they notified after his death. I was, I, I have a lot of broken bones in my body. So, 90 minutes in heaven. Guess why he had to go back to come back on earth? From that conference, there were other ministers behind him, and one of them came up and prayed for him to return, singing hymns for an hour and a half. And he had a painful return, but that's why he had to come back. There's usually a, a hidden reason, but uh, very interesting uh Man, but you can see he went right to the pearly gates. And I give you the references in Revelation where pearly gates are, are described just as he mentioned it. So <clears throat> you can see how people are getting closer and closer. The atheists only saw heaven from a very distant perspective. And each one of us will experience those things that we love the most in earth if you love beautiful flowers and the aromas of flowers that's where mary c neal went to if you're an <coughs> indian irish person who loves the forest she was taken into the heart of the forest and felt at home what type of person would be able to get beyond the pearly gates can anybody think of one yeah Pastor is about as high as you can go, right? Nope. There's one more. And we'll go to it right now. Oh, this is his car. He had a, like a pinto run over by a semi tractor trailer truck. So I, it was hard, hard to find that picture. There's a movie made of the same story, but the car isn't nearly as demolished. So this is Don Piper's thing with the Revelation references. We're now going to look at Colton Burpo. He was a four-year-old child. Children. Jesus said, you know, the children are the purest in, in hearts. They are the innocent. Guess where Col Colton Bur Burpo went to? 
I'll show you. The throne room. <laughs> be patient, be patient. <laughs> Imagine a child that young being taken from his parents and by people he's never seen. How old are you today? Me. And what is your name? And where do you live? In Nebraska. Who's your mommy? Sonia. Who's your daddy? Who's your sister? Jackson. That was eight years ago. Looking at Colton now, you would have never guessed that he almost died in 2003. His father, Todd, tells about Colton's near-death experience in the book, Heaven is for Real. And he started throwing up into the toilet, you know, and uh, at first we're like, okay, he's got the stomach flu because the doctor said it was going around. Colton's condition only got worse as days passed. His doctor discovered his appendix had burst and infection was spreading in his body. Time was running out. And we knew we were in bad shape when they, they say, well, you need to come out to the hallway. They separated us from everyone else. And then someone came to us and started talking to us that uh, we got to have surgery on your kid. It was tough. Um, senior boy, he lifeless when he was a very vibrant child. And it was at that moment that we were looking at each other. I remember my wife holding Colton in that hallway, just us. He's not even moving. We went to the surgery prep area, and I remember them hauling him away and him just yelling at me, Daddy, don't let him take me. Daddy, don't let him take me. And I went back to the, uh, uh, the pre-op room where we had left some stuff. And I was finally alone, shut the door. And I just broke down, and I was mad at God. I just frustrated fed up. And I remember telling him, I said, God, after all I've done for you, and now you're going to take my kid? This is how you treat your pastors? And I was calling our parachain. I was calling anybody that would be on the other line to get Colton on the parachain because it was bad. We were there in the waiting room for an hour and a half, maybe. Then I remember the nurse coming out. Uh, is Colton's daddy out here? I'm like, yeah, well, Colton's a... a, a in recovery and he's screaming for you and I'm sitting there with him and I remember my son in that room then looking up at me and goes dad do you know I almost died and my first thought was maybe overheard the nurse say that or maybe they thought he was under anesthesia you know and, and he wasn't but it wasn't till four months after we got out of the hospital that we finally listened to our son and that's where I got to see heaven no Jesus and some angels came and flew me up to heaven and I said, so Colton, what did Jesus look like? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. He was wearing white robes with a purple sash. And he just came down nicely and gracefully. Well, Dad, Jesus has markers. Dad, Jesus has markers. I didn't know what he meant. So I finally asked the right question. Colton, where are Jesus' markers? And he drops his toys down, and he stands up, and he just points, Dad, they were right here. He takes his fingers, points to the palms, then he bends over and touches the tops of his feet and looks up to me, and that's where Jesus' markers were, Dad. When I was in the throne room of God to start with, so I got to see what that looked like. I was upset because I didn't know what was happening. What God did is he used people that, people or things that I liked, to calm me down. From there on, I felt better. And one day we're traveling together and he looks up at me and, Dad, you used to have a grandpa named Pop, didn't you? And I'm like, yeah, he's really nice. Really? Yeah, you used to play with him as a kid and fix, work with him on the farm and, and shoot stuff with him. And I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? Well, he told me. A figure came up and he was Pop. He asked me, are you Todd's son? 
I said yes. He said that he was his grandpa, so that's where I met him. Yeah, Pop, uh, I was very close to him, and he was my most significant male role model when I was a kid growing up. Kid, but he was killed in a car wreck before I turned seven. Um, I was busy paying bills again, because um, that's uh, my job. And he came up and told me he had two sisters. Well, he had to say it several times before he finally got my attention. And finally, I put myself down and looked at him and says, what do you mean you have two sisters? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby dying in your tummy. And I just looked at him like, well, how do you know you have two sisters? Well, she told me. And then he proceeded to describe her. She looked like Cassie, but she had brown hair. And first time when she saw me, she just came up and hugged me. We knew. <laughs> this was true because he said she kept hugging me. She wouldn't stop hugging me, Mom, and I didn't like that. Well, I'm not really the hugging type. <laughs> I miscarried the weekend of Father's Day weekend, which made it even rougher. And we thought we'd dealt with it. We got over. We accepted that the baby had died. But when he said he had two sisters, I was, I think I was in shock first and then. You can watch the whole thing if you want. It's, uh, it'll be in my slides. <clears throat> Get me back to my slides here. Click the PowerPoint. I don't see it. <clears throat> oh, is that red one? Yeah. So, Here's some of the th throne of God. It's mentioned in the Bible a number of times. Jesus has markers. The Bible says the slave do does not remain in the house forever. We are the slave. The son remains forever. He's the only one up in heaven who has his body from earth because it had no sin in it. So Colton met Pop, and for a long time, they tried to see if that story was true. They kept showing him pictures of Pop. And no, that's not Pop. That's not Pop. Finally, they found a real old picture of him just when he was getting married. That's Pop. So he's in his 30s. Most people in heaven are in their 30s. Then... He was interested to see, you know, which picture of the ones we have of Jesus did he like the best? Colton, is this Jesus? No. 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 And just recently, after Colton's experience, within, say, five or ten years, there was a little girl, not little, she was about eight, who loved to paint. And Jesus had rescued her from drowning. And she came out, she painted a picture of Jesus. And he's not white, like all these pictures show. He's from the Middle East. God's brilliance doesn't make him white or black, but he makes him brown. And that's what Jesus really looks like. So I, th I think... The other thing about the throne room that I wanted to tell you is they ask him about the throne room. Who sits on his right hand? Well, that's where Jesus sits. Who sits on his left hand? And he said, that's where his cousin, John the Baptist, sits. Isn't that interesting? So... All of the things I've played for you are here in the slide set. Um, we're all baptized in one spirit to be in unity with God and Christ. So Romans tells us to sacrifice your body 
to the spiritual needs of the soul. God is love, and we should all have 1 Corinthians 13, 4 memorized. What is love? Because that is what we need to be like. The one I have the most problem with is and does not insist on his own way. Oh, boy. That's a challenge for me. Overcome evil with good, even for your enemies. And in this day and age of voting, let me tell you about unadulterated love. You're sitting at home, let's say you may have a Harrison voting sign in your front yard, and your neighbor who's got a Trump sign in their yard says, my car broke down, I need a ride to vote. And you say, absolutely. <laughs> you have to have unadulterated love, love your neighbor as yourself, without question. If you can get, get there, that is great. I'm still working, but um, what is sin, <clears throat> prideful sin? Many of us have too much pride in what our bodies have done for us, not what our spirits have done. So we didn't get to see this, but uh, it's in the video by uh, Dr. Mary Neal. And what you see is a cup, right? In the middle of the screen. That's if you look, focus on the white. If you focus on the blue, what do you see? Two faces. Yeah. And it takes a, took me a little while to see it, but you can see it if you focus on the blue. But the blue is heaven. And if we don't have heaven in our life, we're not going to see the full picture of what life offers us while we're here on earth. So questions, thank you very much. How do you know that most people in heaven are in their 30s? <laughs> um, the actual, actually, Don Piper talks about it. His, his grandmother that had no teeth had beautiful teeth, just amazing teeth. His grandpa was missing fingers because he was a farmer and had lost fingers on his left hand. They were all there. Pete, uh, and I haven't played for you any uh, people that were blind who went to heaven and they could see all the brilliant colors. So there's a number of NDEs I haven't been able to get for you, but they're all in about the 30s. And the picture of Todd Burpo's pop, the, the grandpa of his dad, was in his 30s. That's the picture that he recognized. If you think about it, Adam and Eve didn't come Adam and Eve didn't come to earth as babies, right? They were in their 30s. So we were meant to be at that age, I think. I'm just guessing. Right? I'm not all knowledgeable here. Remember who I am. I'm Dave Goodale. And that, that <laughs> sends out the blast emails. But... Um, we're going we're gonna to take this to a new level next spring when we talk about how angels are helping us on a daily basis. We don't even see them. Yes? Dave, I, I had the honor of listening to Mary Neal, Neal in person at Ion's conference. And when she was under the waterfall for 30 minutes and actually did indeed die, she is a spine surgeon that uh, practices in... Um, <laughs> Wyoming, she and her husband are both, both orthopedic surgeons. They, she was actually floating down the river and one of the kayak people 
thought that they didn't realize it was her body. And one of the kayak people wanted to retrieve her uh, life vest for her husband. They thought it had come off of her. So he went to grab the life vest and mm -hmm. actually realized that she was there. And the, my point being is synchronicity. We talk about the angels being with us. They knew she was dead. And when they finally got her uh, out of the river, they realized, and, and she started, very laboriously started, started to breathe. They were praying over her. Three Inca, three native Chileans um, actually appeared out of nowhere. And when you're on the banks of Chile there and kayaking, because these are very um, soft, the, the, for kayakers, these rivers are, are considered wonderful rivers to kayak. Um, these three uh, native Indians appeared and they put her on the kayak and they had machetes. They had to machete their way straight up out of a bamboo cliff to get to, and also her husband who'd been reading, he didn't feel well and he had been reading and he was at the very top of the um, cliff. They had to, to machete her up there and there was an ambulance. There was an ambulance, right, this is a synchronicity, right there and she said looking back on it, the person that didn't say a word, did not say a word, but the ambulance driver was kind of, uh, was in a suit kind of like Mario. It was a very obscure ambulance and it was a very obscure uh, ambulance driver's suit. And they had to go about two hours to get to a medical, very, very tiny makeshift medical facility. And then the ambulance drivers and then the, the natives evaporated. They just literally, they didn't, nobody said a word. Mm -hmm. Nobody said a word and they had, and, and the ambulance driver and the ambulance mm -hmm. evaporated. And they said to the person who was in the medical facility, she, she said, Do, who were these people? So we don't have any, there's no one around here that fits this description. So basically what I, my point being is the synchronicity that we it, come into every single day. Absolutely. So <clears throat> that's a preamble because she researched that a lot. Mary C. Neal did, just as she described it. And they had to be angels because there was there wasn't anybody that owned an ambulance anywhere, but yet it was parked on the road waiting for. Her. So um, you're gonna find that we are enabled by our, our God in heaven in ways that we can't imagine. And even though she went back and researched it, there were no people like she described in that area ever, but they suddenly appeared on the bank of the river. So thank you for that. Joe. Yeah, I, you referenced me in the beginning. And when I first met you, I swore, where do I know this guy? Where I, I, We talked for a good half hour. I know you from somewhere, I know you from somewhere, then you laid it on me. We were probably spirits of heaven. So you're my soul brother. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't tell me, you looked through all the jail records. That you <laughs> and didn't all, them, all them Guinnesses we got. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Yes, I believe that many of us are spirit brothers and sisters from heaven, and um, it's amazing how um, intertwined we actually are in our lives, so blessings on everyone. So anyway, I'll send out all these slides. You can watch the videos, the, the videos are great. I had to truncate them because I wanted to get in all five, but there's some things here. We chose our lives so we could grow better spiritually while we're down here. And we also uh, have a God that instantaneously will respond to our prayers, even though there's billions of people on this planet now. He's right there for each and every one of us. 
and he loves you and you more than anyone else in the world. What a blessing. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.